topic is, are we in the middle of a turnaround but don't really know it yet? And because I always run out of time, I'm going to talk first about what my product's all about. I've just done a major revamp. Uh, I've lowered the price to uh, $450 a year for all access. And I've created a new rating system which allows me, even when I waste time reviewing a company that turns out to be a dud, to record that for the benefit of all the members so that they can see this is a waste of time to research further. So if you go into my system, you'll find companies that are still unrated. Some like producers I will never rate because that's not my area of expertise. Then there's zombie companies. These are companies with a bad balance sheet, negative working capital. Until they fix that, these things are the walking dead and you generally want to avoid them. Though sometimes, if you're an extreme bottom fisher, very sophisticated, you can make huge scores buying these things in the dumpster. No spec value is a new thing that's going to cause me a lot of grief from the companies that get rated at that because these are companies where I look at the story and I just don't see a story. I see no wealth creation potential and I look at the way the company manages itself and I say this is a lifestyle company. If I get my readers into this, they're probably never going to make money. There might be a pump and dump that they can, but I won't as an analyst be able to really comment intelligently about what's going on. Then there's poor spec value, and those are actually real companies. But these are companies that are so well promoted, there's more downside than upside left. So these are ones you generally want to avoid if we get into a rising tide market again. These, of course, will end up doing much better and get even more overpriced. The three categories that are most important are the ones that I rate as bottom fish spec value, fair spec value, and good spec value. Bottom fish are companies where there's some missing piece. Maybe they're lacking proper promotional skills or, or some, maybe they're waiting for a permit on something. Uh, uh, anything that sort of uh, keeps them from head taking off right now. And this is probably the best upside value because when these things change, these stocks move dramatically. Fair spec value are the more advanced companies that have uh, competent people, have everything going, and the upside is balanced with the downside. And in, in, in this game, you're really betting on fundamental outcomes in the exploration sector. And good spec value is actually quite rare. It's when I think the market is mispricing a company and that it should actually be higher so that the um, upside and downside are in balance. So I've got over 150 of them rated as of uh, the end of the year. They're in the system. Um, uh, I've also, you, you go to like the, for, for people who are newcomers, these things are all you really need to know about. The spec value daily has all of them in there daily market action, any news releases that show up, charts, you go there on a daily basis, check it out, and get on top of it. And uh, all the comments, negative or positive, are, show up in the uh, KRO comments. Now, what I have done is created a favorites. Right now, there's 19 of them, which are a subset of ones that uh, I'm interested in talking about in much greater detail than the others. And there'll be companies moved onto this and off of it over time, and I've blanked out most of them so that you might want to actually subscribe. ATAC and PJX are two of my favorites, and West Haven is also a favorite. And this video here will be probably up by the end of the end of the month, but for those of you who are not subscribers, if you write down this MIF 20190131, I'll let you get it for the 350 deal that I gave to my past and former subscribers to the end of December 31st. So if you subscribe, put that in the box and, uh, and, and, and we'll get you the 350 deal. Did you all get that? And for those of you who really can't afford it, there's a lot of stuff for free on my website. All these things, you click on them, it's a gateway to finding out uh, 
stuff about uh, you know projects that are in countries, uh, in certain regions. Uh, you can find out a lot about the metals and things like that. So a lot of free stuff, a free sort of st stripped down corporate profile. You can click on any of these little bubbles that are in there and something like this will pop up and this, this, you get the most recent news release. This takes you into the members only. This takes you to the uh, free thing where you can sort of get your bearings. So I'm trying to serve both those who are paying me and those who aren't paying me. And I'm optimistic that within a year, all those people doing the free stuff are also going to be subscribing. Now, one other thing that I do, you'll see this little uh, metals investor forum. I don't have time to take in all these talks here myself. But the Metals Investor Forum makes videos of them and these interviews, puts them on YouTube, and I spend a day collecting them all, putting them in one place so that you can go there and click on them and catch up on what you may have missed yesterday or later this afternoon. So we are now in the eighth year of a bear market. And uh, you can see the. Uh, here was the, uh, we had a, a, a bullish cycle. This is the traded value of TSX venture resource sector companies. And the green is the other stuff, the cannabis blockchain and all these other things. And you can see we are still pretty feeble right now. The cannabis stuff are having a bit of a rebound, but we are not yet out of the woods in terms of uh, this uh, sector. So. Why are you guys still here? What are you really hoping for? What do you think will change? Are you insane, like you keep coming and uh, nothing ever, ever, ever turns around? You know, we talk about seven years of feast and seven years of famine. We had those seven years of uh, feast from sort of mid-2003 until uh, 2011, and now we've had seven years of uh, Famine, and people say, oh yeah, it must be time for the feast to come again. <laughs> but if you're familiar with your Old Testament, uh, enslavement actually followed that famine period, <laughs> and we had to wait for the exodus to the promised land. Now, what is the promised land for this resource sector? It has always been gold. And so the question is, is gold finally going to go into a sustained uptrend that ends this miserable bear market that we're in. And in November, I did a presentation where I walked through all the reasons why gold should go up. I'm not going to do that today, but if you go and click on that and watch it again, it is still completely valid. So one of my big themes is that uh, the global order that the United States crafted after uh, 1945 is being undone and it's changing and we're entering a period of extreme uncertainty where history has many, many forks, and we don't know which ones are going to go, the, the things are going to take. And one of the things that I expect is fragmentation of the global economy into a smaller zones as groups square off against each other in a major geopolitical conflict. So I'm going to just sort of quickly walk through the various metals. The thing that's going to push this conflict, uh, this uh, uh, fragmentation, is uh, the American policy of uh, a trade war, the attempt to stop China's ascent to equality both in economy and in military uh, 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 c capacity. And no, no trade talks are going to change the fact that the United States knows that with its 350 million people compared to China's billion and a half, and the fact that China is actually a thug nation where it controls everything, it stifles the people, it's, it's a hybrid capitalist communist uh, uh, corporation. Uh, it's tough for the United States to compete in the long run. And the Obama policy was to create a pivot to Asia and try to manage this and, and make it a graceful transition to a, a world of balanced powers. But the current policy is no, we actually want to stay in charge of every, everything and we need to stop China. And that is not going to happen. So right now we're looking at a possible downturn. 
China's already starting to cave in with its uh, own internal problems, and uh, the, uh, the trade war is starting to also accelerate that. Um, so for most of the metals, the outlook right now is not particularly positive. Um, if we see uh, demand, macro demand go down, you're going to see the um, metal prices go down. And the producers, after they got slapped around in 2013-14, have adopted this attitude of, well, we are not going to do this silly thing of overexpanding our supply, and we're, we're just going to sit tight and you know, shut down the marginal assets. And if we do get continued economic growth, we will end up uh, making a ton of money. And down the road, we'll think about uh, going and acquiring acquiring things again when our shareholders are no longer mad at us and are actually screaming at us to expand our production capacity. But the negative scenario is that maybe these guys are right and that what we're facing is a global downturn which will put pressure on metal prices which means that what they did, like not put new supply into the pipeline, was smart and so they won't go up in price but the problem is the cash flow multiples are going to go down as a world starts thinking we're going into a depression of sorts. So um, copper has had all this hype about the car, electric vehicles, and so on. I think the electric vehicle momentum is probably stalled for now. And uh, copper comes from many parts of the world. I'm not particularly bullish on copper. I don't think it's going to go down substantially. This 250 to $3 a pound range is uh, good for now but uh, it's not really a great optionality play. Uh, if you're going to be in copper stories, you want to go to the ones that are higher grade, that are things like uh, 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 Sun Metal's uh, Stardust project, or what uh, ATAC will be telling you about later, their new Bobcat play on the, uh, on the Rackla belt. Now zinc is a different animal. You look at this chart here, and this is, the, the, the Shanghai and LME warehouse stocks are almost the same as they are here, but we have not yet seen that. And China is now actually a net importer of zinc, and its capacity to expand supply is probably stopped because they are waking up to the problem that their people are pretty pissed that their environment is very, very polluting. So zinc is a metal that I am quite bullish on. It's not going to go to two bucks a pound or something like that, but I think it'll end up being in the 125 to 150 area, and that's where optionality plays do become quite important. Now, this here I have as kind of an example, and you see this incredible spike that happened 2009 to 2011, when the Chinese basically started to withhold supply to the rest of the world, and we had this enormous run-up in all the rare earth prices. And the trigger of it was a spat with Japan over some islands that both countries uh, claim that, uh, that they own. Now, if we do get into this geopolitical conflict with China and the United States suddenly at odds with each other, where is the, are the rare earths going to come from? Right now, in the light rare earths and in the heavy rare earths, they're all terrible. Neodymium is the uh, metal used for uh, 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 the electric car vehicles, and uh, so demand for that should remain strong, but dysprosium, which is a key to keeping it, innovation has reduced the amount of it needed. But what's really terrible about this sector is that yttrium, which is the dominant heavy rare earth in those uh, so-called heavy rare earth deposits, it has lost its market in lighting, which has been displaced by new LED technology. So yttrium is one of those metals out there screaming for a new demand. And until that happens, or until China suddenly shuts down its supply, uh, the rare earths are going to stay in this doggy situation. But I wouldn't be in a hurry to buy rare earth stocks right now. I would wait for China to annex Taiwan and ask the United States, what are you going to do about that? And right now, what my biggest concern about where the US policy is going is it's pu pushing companies or encouraging countries to push the envelope in terms of their local 
territorial ambitions. And by withdrawing from the global stage as the leader, the United States is basically opening up all kinds of stuff. And when it starts to happen, and then the United States jumps up and down, says, oh, we need to push back, and they've meanwhile turned all their allies into enemies and embraced all the thugs like Russia and Putin and that, nobody's gonna listen to them. So we are going to enter a period of these types of ambitions, and things that come from China are ones that are going to suddenly have no, not, uh, no, 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 no high prices in China, but elsewhere very high prices, and there'll be a scramble to find sources of these metals outside of China. The lithium space is pretty much done. You can see that the carbonate has dropped back from sort of $12 a pound to $6 a pound. The Chileans are increasing their uh, salar per brine production. And the Australians have ramped up uh, their abundant pegmatite uh, hard rock sources. So lithium is not a story you really want to be chasing. Now cobalt is still critical to the electric vehicles. And if you're tracking what's going on in Congo, basically um, the main guy, Kayulu, he, uh, 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 he had 59% of the vote but they declared the winner the uh, sort of, not Kabila's favorite, but uh, another party which had 19% who appears to have been compromised and made Kabila's stooge. And Kabila himself is a stooge of Kagame, Paul Kagame, who runs Rwanda as de facto president for life and kind of runs a, a DRC remote control. So the DRC is ready to go back into a civil war and while they produce a fair amount of copper, they provide 60, 65% of uh, the uh, cobalt in the world. And they could actually, if the place got stable, could supply all the needs that anybody would ever possibly need in terms of uh, cobalt. So cobalt's going to be interesting. The price, as you can see, has come back to sort of $25 a pound. It's no longer up there at $35 a pound. And that has hurt a lot of these nickel cobalt laterite plays, which we're hoping to uh, benefit from this higher cobalt price. Now, vanadium has been the hot metal lately. That's the newest one juniors are piling into. And you can see it ran to, uh, for ferro uh, vanadium, it ran up to $60 a pound. It's, it's crashed back to $30 a pound. And its market is mainly uh, as a hardener for steel. It's a substantial market. Now what's interesting is a lot, most of it comes from Russia, China, and South Africa. Um, Brazil is starting to supply it. So, uh, but still there's this question, uh, these countries dominate because they have resources that they can produce at a relatively low cost. And the vanadium steel market is not going to increase anything better than the uh, you know, global, global GDP growth. But the new thing is long-term storage for the intermittent energy sources, uh, solar and, uh, and wind. And that's what's driving the interest in vanadium, the idea that there's gonna be a whole new layer of demand that's going to emerge over the next decade and that will scale up uh, the, uh, uh, well, well the, the, the total demand for vanadium. Now, niobium is another steel input, and uh, uh, it's like completely just for strengthening steel, and most of it, 85%, comes from Brazil, where we now have a new leader who thinks that he is an, another Trump, and uh, he wants to turn Brazil back into a military dictatorship of sorts, and I'm not sure that's going to happen, but whatever he does could end up destabilizing Brazil which is going to be a problem for niobium. And one of my stocks that I wrote up uh, last week uh, is, a, is a bottom, as a bottom fish. It's a bottom fish because they are awaiting a social license. It's a niobium stock. It'll be the sort of thing that goes from 20 cents to two to four dollars in the next while because the world really wants additional sources of niobium. And this deposit is as good as what Niobec is now, which is the source of uh, the, the niobium that doesn't come from Brazil in Quebec. Now nickel has not been helpful to the nickel cobalt story because it's back below 
$5 a pound. Um, the warehouse stocks have dropped considerably, but they're still nowhere near as low as in the uh, 2000s when the uh, price of nickel ran to $20, $25 a pound. And nickel has fairly broad distribution, but I want to point out palladium. Palladium has now made a record price high, higher than the manipulation in, what was it, 2001, when uh, the Don Rolfs boys uh, suddenly withheld supply and put the squeeze to all the car makers, because palladium goes into gasoline-powered uh, cars, the catalytic converters. Platinum is in the doghouse because it is used in the diesel uh, cat catalytic converters, and of course that has, uh, uh, with, with the Volkswagen scandal and the others that have seemed appear to have imitated, there's a huge backlash against uh, diesel, at least as far as ordinary consumer cars are concerned. So there is a sudden imbalance, and most of it comes from Noril, and then the rest comes from uh, South Africa. Now in South Africa, the platinum-palladium ratio is higher. There's more platinum per unit of uh, palladium, but elsewhere in the world it's reversed. There's more palladium. But because Norilsk is such a fabulous mine and produces it as a byproduct, uh, and they are now in an expansion, but the expansion is going to take two more years. So we're into a possible palladium bubble. And, and of course, uh, back to sort of the, the my uh, foreign, my geopolitical conflict theme, the, the Russians have seized these three ships in the Sea of Azov, uh, which is part of the Ukraine. These are Ukrainian ships. And there was even some official mouthing off about how the Ukraine is not going to be a state for very long. And of course, they're really pissed that uh, the Orthodox Church has split and made its own Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And they're really trying to push back against the Russians. And Russia's already annexed Crimea, and it's sort of invaded the eastern half of the Ukraine, and it's got this grand mission of rebuilding the Soviet Union, repatriating all these countries. And uh, what is the United States going to do if all of a sudden there is a hostile takeover of the Ukraine? Well, more sanctions and stuff? Ah, oh, well, that well, means like no more palladium for our catalytic converters. So I think there is a little boom coming to revisit North American uh, uh, you know, nickel, nickel uh, magmatic systems and that where you do have a palladium potential. You know, uranium, people always say, John, John, you know, why don't you like uranium? Isn't it going to repeat the past? Uh, well, we are not in the same circumstances as we were in 2004 when the utility stockpiles from, uh, you know, seven... Uh, uh, the uh, Chernobyl and all that stuff in the, in the 80s had finally been drawn down, where the Russian uh, uh, uranium after its collapse was no longer coming into the market. We have something like the reverse. We have the Japanese utilities piling up the stuff because they have not yet restarted their nuclear industry, and we've got Germany has been winding down. So we have had this oversupply, but the really big problem is Kazakhstan, that big, dark blotch there. They came out of nowhere in the past 12 years. They do it with in-situ leaching. They don't worry about environmental issues or anything like that. And um, they have basically killed the uranium market and can continue to do so. But again, if the world becomes unstable and the United States ends up in a conflict with Russia and, and, and that part of the world suddenly is unable to supply these metals, we go back into a uranium boom. But until Kazakhstan goes offline, it'll be a number of years before we get a uranium boom because we need $50 a pound or better uranium to really make anything work, even in the Athabasca Basin. And Chemical right now has shut down MacArthur because it really didn't want to keep mining that at a loss. So they have the ability to keep supplying it. And oil oil's really interesting too. Uh, what's happening in the Middle East is unusual. You know, 10, 15 years ago, the United States was all about keeping the peace in the Middle East so that oil could flow to all the world and its needs be met. Well, now the United States is the largest producer in the world thanks to shale oil. And when, shale, when the oil price goes down below 40 bucks, that's not particularly good for the profitability of fracking the, uh, the shale oil uh, uh, regions. Uh, so having a higher 
oil price is actually strategically beneficial. And, you know, shutting down Iran, so that it's not a supplier, allowing them to go berserk in the Middle East and start fighting each other and shutting down Saudi supply, that's all very beneficial to the United States. And, of course, uh, it'll help Russia, too, because they can ship it from, from, a, from a different part of the region. Uh, but that whole area in the Middle East, uh, that's another huge source of potential conflict. Now, gold. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty negative about most of the other metals ex except for reasons that I don't particularly like, like things going wrong in the world. But um, gold isn't really used for anything. There's seven billion ounces sitting there doing nothing. Uh, it comes from lots of parts of the world, so it's, it's not like, a, like if China goes offline, who cares? They buy all their own gold production anyways. They're building up their... Uh, central bank uh, resources. Um, but you can see gold's been sideways since uh, pulling back from its peak in 2011. And uh, uh, I think we're ready for a completely different audience to start to embrace gold. And the reason people will be buying it is not the usual nonsense about fiat currency debasement and hyperinflation, but it is a rising fear that America has become synonymous with Humpty Dumpty that is teetering on the wall, and when Humpty Dumpty falls off, nobody will be able to put Humpty Dumpty together again. And right now, the policies that are driving the U.S., there won't be a change of government for two years. So we have a two-year window where nothing will get better. Even if Trump suddenly decides to, 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 to resign and stop being president, it still won't change it because we are going through an inflection where the world has realized America is abandoning its role of maintaining the global order. And once that perception has changed, it won't switch back again anytime soon. And well, yeah, you're not gonna sell the US dollar to load up on euros or things like that, um, but you can buy gold as an alternative to park some of your wealth. And you have to go back to thinking about the 30s. What was it like in the 30s? People who lived during that period have largely passed away. The memory of what it was like is just in books and TV shows and that, which is not the same as having experienced it yourself and being able to tell others. There, there's a writer, Sinclair Lewis, some of you may know him, he documented uh, the American middle class in the 20s through books like Babbitt and Main, Main Street. And then in the early 30s, he was watching what was going on and he wrote uh, a book um, called It Can't Happen Here. And you know, when I first read it, I said, oh yeah, yeah, okay. So he speculated that uh, the United States would become like, uh, like, like Nazi Germany. And, but then I looked at the date, it was written in 1932. And everybody thinks of Nazi Germany in terms of what it ended up being going completely out of control. It didn't have to go as extremely crazy as it did, but the shift to a thug culture where a small group with all their uh, uh, minions uh, controlling society, there seems to be a collective uh, desire around the world to become like that, to have some dear leader that they all follow blindly. And uh, we are entering that zone in the United States, uh, and precisely because nothing is going to change uh, in the next two years, the tension is going to keep going up. And when these other countries start pushing the envelope, testing America's resolve to push back, uh, then you're going to see stresses rise. And if the shutdown carries on indefinitely and the uh, US economy starts to tank, well, if people are mad now, how much madder will they get when we end up in a 30s type situation where jobs are being lost, where the economy is grinding down? So the anger that we're seeing out there in this populism is possibly nothing compared what's to come. And uh, I ask myself, where are the gold bucks? You know, gold bucks. Why have you forsaken me? Gold. Well, they've, 
piled into this cow pie called Bitcoin. Um, you, you look at the uh, debt increasement, increasing chart there, the projections for what, what uh, the current president is going to do, and he's probably going to outdo the previous president, but that doesn't seem to bother anybody anymore. The gold bugs are not enthusiastic about gold because that means they have to give thumbs down to their man. So we have an interesting situation. The cryptocurrency bubble is, is, is pretty much done. There, there's hundreds and hundreds of cryptocurrencies. Uh, you can't really do anything. It's, it's like an OTC bulletin board stock. That is gone. It's not going to replace anything. It always was parasitical on, on real currencies uh, because that's what you use to discover the price of goods and services. So something is happening right now. And I don't know how many of you people here watch uh, MSNBC with Rachel Maddow. I've, I have friends who are addicted to this show. They, they watch this. And then I have friends who are addicted to Fox watching that other stuff. And the interesting thing is those people that you might classify as liberal as opposed to, to non-liberal, the impotence that they are suffering right now is extreme. And we're facing a possible change of the audience for gold, which has been traditionally shunned by liberal thinking people because it's been sort of the property of this more right-wing gold bug contingent. But the gold bugs, they're, they're, they're now not that interested in gold. So watch what's going to happen in the next while. And I think it was on Wednesday or Thursday, somebody called Sam Zell was being interviewed uh, and he made some comment that the first time in his life he has bought gold. And I was mentioning this to a conventional gold bug and this person said, oh, he's a liberal. I said, yes. <laughs> It's starting to happen, and we've lost the audience in our sector because we like dig and explore for gold and that, and, and it's regarded as lame. But you have a whole younger generation starting to worry about what is going on in the big picture? Where is this world going? And gold, buying gold could actually be a protest against all this stuff that's going on. And, and of course, for people who are thinking coherently about all this, putting some of their wealth into gold at this point in time and just hoping that it proves unfounded, uh, uh, that's the smart thing to do. So gold, after sort of basing here at the sort of $1,200 to $1,400 range, where it is basically $400 gold in 1980, inflation adjusted to the present, it's ready to go higher in real price terms. Now, it, to go to $2,500, $3,000 is only a double. That makes the uh, you know, $8 trillion uh, worth uh, $16 trillion, which is still a drop in the bucket when you add up the value of everybody's real estate. And real estate is really the basis of wealth, the wealth, wealth of the world. So in a context where there isn't any inflation, possibly even deflation, um, we have something like the 30s, except in the 30s, the gold price was fixed. It was not allowed to float. So we will start seeing this trend. When gold breaks through 1400 and starts charting basically new real price territory, um, it's going to snowball. Everybody's going to want to get into it. And for now, it isn't really happening, so it's just an idea. But it is what gives me faith in this sector that we are actually in the middle of a turnaround. And you know, until we uh, uh, do, get that breakout in gold, um, it's still focused on exploration plays that are targeting deposits that work with the prices that we have. And gold is the one that's most likely to go up in real terms in the next while. And here's one that I'm watching. This is like a bottom fish type company. West Haven spent six, seven years in the Spences Bridge Belt in southern BC. And uh, you know, just coming up with marginal gold grades, and then finally a breakthrough into a zone under cover, overburden in a rock type that they haven't really been looking at, 
And this could be maybe a couple of million high-grade ounces, but it could also be a lot bigger. And so we're almost in a place like 1992 when the Diamet stuff, and interestingly, the key shareholder of this is Gren Thomas from, from Aber, where we saw this Diamet thing come out of nowhere, and it started to breathe life into it. And then a year later, in 1993, everything went insane. We are now in that type of a year. And in terms of the bigger picture, we are like in the late 70s, where America had slunk out of Vietnam, was being beaten up by OPEC, uh, uh, got, had their puppet kicked out of Iran and their embassy taken hostage. Their helicopters all uh, got sand in their gears and couldn't rescue them. Russia was invading uh, Afghanistan to, to deal with uh, the Muslims uh, that were radiating into their stand territories and destabilizing it. And it really looked like America was losing it. Now, we had inflation at that time that sort of helped gold, gold do well. But gold was largely a catch-up. And when it stabilized at 400, afterwards, America got its act together, tamed inflation, beat the Soviets uh, in their Cold War a decade later, and we had a 25-year bear market in gold where gold did nothing. But we are now in a place like those late 70s where gold is going to end up rebasing in real price terms in the $2,000 to $3,000 range. And for now, focus on the expiration and don't assume gold is going to do that, but be aware that in the background, all of a sudden the wind could be behind our back in this space rather than in our face. And uh, that pretty much uh, wraps up uh, my uh, presentation.